Now, so let's correct? let's start with our next talk. I think we uh, take a step back away from the details of coding and uh, techniques and such as we heard in the last talk here in this room at least to get a broader view on the evolution in our field of profession over the last years. And maybe we'll get a look into the future too. Remember, we have uh, the 10th edition of FOSCON, so we have uh, some time to look back. Please welcome Simon Wardley. Hello. Okay, I'm, um, I'm going to talk about that dreaded word called business. Um, so a lot of this is going to be about um, uh, markets, about how things are changing, uh, some of the stuff we're doing in um, uh, UK government as well. So I'm going to talk about situation normal, everything must change. Uh, a couple of words of warning uh, before I start. Um, I happen to like kitten pictures, so apologies for this. And I also happen to be a scientist by training, which means I like graphs. So um, here's a quick graph. The level of audience pain, that's you, against the number of slides given in a 45-minute presentation. I reckon there's a safe limit of about 30. Um, being a scientist, I like to experiment, so I'll be using no less than 280. Um, I know what you're probably thinking. Uh, don't worry, you do feel like you're going to get a bit lost. Uh, there are plenty of signposts along the way. I'm going to start off by talking about an issue called uh, situational awareness, mapping. I'm going to talk about why it's important. I'm going to talk about how to map an environment, uh, the so what, why does it matter, uh, some general lessons of economic learning, a bit about gameplay and the use of open source for this, and then try and summarize it at the end. Um, first of all, before I start, what do you think strategic gameplay is like in the boardrooms of most companies? A uh, game of chess or alchemy gut feel and whatever's in the HBR? Who's for a game of chess? None of you. That's about right. Uh, of about 600 companies surveyed, about two were a game of chess and 598 were alchemy, gut feel and whatever's in the HBR. And, and the problem is a, a thing called situational awareness. Um, and to explain it, I'm going to use two examples. One's a chess world, it's a thought experiment, and one's um, called Thermopylae, historical example. So chess world. Um, I want you to imagine you live in a world where everybody plays chess, and how well you play chess determines your success in this world. And what's interesting is no one's ever seen a chess board. All they've ever seen are these characters on a screen, and you play a game by pressing one of the characters, uh, your opponent sees what you've done, uh, they counter, um, you counter, and the game continues until it's a draw or somebody wins. Now what will happen is over time people will capture these sequences of these games and start to find magic sequences within them. So if you press knight, I should respond with pawn, pawn, queen, or something along those lines. And then, of course, one day you will play a game of chess against somebody who will see something truly magical. Uh, they will see the board. And so you will move, they will counter, you will move, they will counter, and you will have lost. And you will go, what the fiddlesticks happened there? I mean, how is this possible? How could I? Maybe it's the speed at which they press the button. Maybe they're a happy person and culture's got something to do with it. Maybe they had a good lunch. Um, the reality is you lost because you exist in what's known as a low-level situational awareness environment. They exist in a high-level situational awareness environment. Uh, another example of this is Themistocles, uh, ancient politician, Greek general. Uh, he had a problem. Uh, the, um, the Persians were invading. Um, he had choices. He could defend around Thebes. He could defend around Athens. And what he decided to do was block off the Straits of Artemisium, force the Persians along the coastal road into uh, a narrow pass called Thermopylae, where a small number of troops could defend against a larger force. Uh, there were about 7,000-odd Greeks, including 300 Spartans, and that's where the story of the 300 come from. Um, so I want you to imagine it's the eve of battle. You're standing there. 
Themistocles is in front of you and says, I don't understand the landscape. I don't understand the environment. I have no map, but have no fear, because I have created a SWOT diagram. Strengths a well-trained Spartan army, a high level of motivation not to become a Persian slave, uh, weaknesses, the E4s might stop the Spartans turning up, a truckload of Persians are turning up, opportunities get rid of the Persians, get rid of the, uh, uh, the Spartans, we're Athenian, we actually hate the Spartans, um, and uh, threats is, you know, the Persians get rid of us, and the Oracle says a really dodgy film might be produced a few thousand years later. Now, what do you think is more effective in combat, a map or a SWOT diagram? Obviously, a... <laughs> that is the problem. <laughs> I assume you have an MBA, sir. <laughs> Yes, yes, a map is slightly more useful in combat than a SWOT diagram, and as you rightly point out, in business, what do we use? A SWOT diagram. Yes, unfortunately, most businesses exist in an environment uh, which basically is based upon low levels of situational awareness. They use verbal reasoning, storytelling, uh, lots of backward causality or meme copying. Uh, they have no sort of representation of context, so they have no position or movement. High-level situational awareness environments uh, tend to have visual reasoning. They are context-specific to the battle at hand, and they have position and movement. Uh, so if you ask a general, why does a general bombard a hill? It's not because 67% of other successful generals bombard hills. It's not because that would make a good story, and it certainly isn't because, well, that's what Uber, uh, Amazon, or Facebook might do. Uh, the, what we do is we tend to use maps. Maps tell us where we can attack. Um, why of strategy is a relative statement. Why here, over there? And then you're into the action, you're into the how, what, and when. So in military terms, it's all about the where and why, situational awareness first, and then action. Anybody got a military background? Unfortunately not. Hmm? Oh, OK. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> so, uh, what's it like in most organizations? Obviously, organizations have strategy documents, um, lots of them. If you rip out things like uh, tactical choices, BYOD, or bring your own disaster, uh, purchasing decisions uh, like Oracle and SAP, uh, operational details like SLAs, implementation details like private and public, uh, which are all about the how, what, and when of action, the why we tend to do stuff is very vague, it's very small, and it's normally because everybody else is doing it. So everybody else is doing digital first, cloud, being agile, being innovative, etc. We should do the same. Uh, this sort of backward causality has been going on for a long time. Uh, back in 1984, we used to write books on the subject uh, in search of excellence. Uh, 62 companies for you to copy and emulate, uh, people like Kodak, uh, Atari. Um, the same thing's going on today. You know, everybody's talking about Uberize the economy. Yes, surge pricing for funerals. Um, so, sorry, Norman, you can't bury mother. It's too expensive, etc. cetera. Um, the reality is we have lots of this going on. So much so that I spent about a year going around various events recording what I like to think of as business level abstractions of a healthy strategy or blahs for short. Uh, here are the common blahs. Uh, digital big data, disruptive, innovative, collaborative, competitive advantage, etc. I collected large numbers of strategy documents, combined them to generate a blah template. Our strategy is blah, we will lead a blah effort of the market through our use of blah and blah to build a blah, etc., etc. Uh, then simply combine the two together, um, common blahs and blah templates, auto-generated 64 completely at random strategies, such as our strategy is customer focused. Uh, we will lead a, um, a disruptive effort of the market through our use of innovative social media and big data to build a collaborative cloud-based ecosystem. 
Strategy two, our strategy is innovative digital business. We will lead a growth effort of the market throughout, well, I'm not gonna go through 64, um, but I sent them around, I got about 300 responses, uh, three basic types. Uh, this is more or less the exact wording from our business plan. I've seen two of these used already, and uh, probably the worst one was, are you for hire? <laughs> <laughs> So a friend of mine's put this all online. This is strategy as a service. Um, so if you, if, you, if you ever need a strategy, just type in the URL and it will automatically generate you one uh, based upon all those, uh, those latest memes. So basically in business, we suck when it comes to uh, situational awareness. Now, does it matter? Well. So about three years ago, I did a study of 160 Silicon Valley companies supposedly at the leading edge of competition. Uh, looked at the level of strategic play or situational awareness uh, versus, in this case, the use of open, as in open source, open data, open processes, open APIs, as a way of manipulating the market. Um, the bigger the bubbles, the more companies in that group. So uh, at the very top, we had uh, Right-hand side, we had companies who had high levels of situational awareness and used open as a way of manipulating markets, uh, sort of the open by thinking crowd. At the bottom right-hand side, again, companies using, uh, providing lots of open, uh, but mm, very low levels of uh, situational awareness. So that's sort of more the open by default, as in, oh, we've got this, let's open it, because if we open it, magically good things will happen. Um, when you looked at market cap over a seven-year period, the companies at the top are uh, very positive, uh, companies at the bottom stagnant or negative. So basically, situational awareness seems to matter. I, if you are um, looking at an environment, uh, well, it's a good idea to look before you shoot. So how do you improve situational awareness? How do you map a business environment? Because we don't seem to have any maps. Uh, businesses are complex things, mass of people, practices, activities, and data, and we normally try to make sense of them through what are called box and wire diagrams, so IT systems diagrams, business process diagrams. Uh, things like this. This is a self-driving car. Now, of course, if I expand that, and there's a little bit in there called a world perception server, if I asked you what should your approach be to a world perception server, should you build it in-house, should you outsource it, use XP, Lean, uh, Six Sigma, you would say? No idea whatsoever. Good, because the diagram itself gives you no context. It gets worse because business and IT use different diagrams, so no one can actually talk to each other, even though we're all in the same organization. So back in 2004, I was CEO of a software company bought out by Canon. I've done four startups, one bought by Dell, one by, by EMC, DHA, and the other Canon. And uh, we had this problem. And I wanted to turn, uh, in terms of uh, our strategy, was just the same as everybody else's. It was just meme copying. So I wanted to turn the organization into some sort of map so that we could all understand what we were doing. Hmm. Now, I knew that my organization consisted of value chains. Uh, we had several of them. Being a Brit, I like to talk in terms of cups of tea, so I'm gonna use that to explain a value chain. Uh, we start off with the user. The user has a need, in this case, say, for a cup of tea. That cup of tea has needs. It needs tea, it needs hot water, it needs other things as well, like a mug, uh, but hot water has needs. It needs cold water, it needs a kettle, and kettle has needs, it needs power. So I took one of our lines of business, very simple, um, say about six, seven million users, 100 terabytes of data, thereabouts, and converted it into a value chain. Uh, this is a simplification. Now this gives me position relative to the user, but it doesn't give me movement. And as such, it's completely useless. And the reason why it's useless is because value chains don't stand still. If you look at somebody like Nokia, it was a paper mill, became a plastics company, became a telecommunications company, now it's becoming something different. Don't ask me what, I don't know. Um, so I, you know, I did the usual thing of thinking in terms of diffusion, something appears, early adopters to laggards. 
Uh, the problem with these diffusion curves is they're all different shapes. Well, sorry, they're all S-curve shapes, but they're all different sizes over different time frames. But I noticed that things not only appeared, they also evolved. So we got a phone, then we got a better phone, or we got something like the Parthian battery in 400 AD, and by about 1886, we had Tesla, Westinghouse, we had utility provision of electricity. So I did a piece of work which looked into this, looking at different types of publication and how they changed. And what I noted was that you start off with the genesis of something, uh, then you get custom-built examples of it, then you get products and rental services, then it becomes more of a commodity, and then eventually you get utility services. So something like the Parthian battery appears, and uh, then you get things like the Hippolyte Pixie, and eventually Siemens generators, and eventually Westinghouse and Tesla. Or something like uh, the, uh, the, um, the Z3, built in 1943, appears. Uh, then you get things like Leo, uh, then the IBM 650, uh, rental services like Timshare, commodity hardware, and eventually utility services like cloud. So there's a process of evolution that is going on. And what drives it is competition. So if you think of business as little more than a cat fight, anytime anyone gains an advantage, some new big gun like e-commerce, then everyone else wants to follow suit. And so what you have is a constant demand for anything which is useful. But at the same time, suppliers want to provide that demand, and someone introduces a new thing like kit and body armor, and someone will make a better version. And so what you have is supply competition as well. So supply and demand competition drives that process of evolution. So now I have two things. I have position relative to a user, the value chain, and I have evolution, which gives me movement. So I took my original value chain back in 2004, 2005, simply flattened that evolution curve, put it at the bottom, put everything in its place, and that was the first map I produced just over 10 years ago. Well, about 10 years ago. And now I had position and movement. Okay, so what? Why does that matter? Well. Many years ago, I wrote something called the Better for Less paper for UK government, which was about transformation of um, uh, government IT. This was back in 2009, 2010, uh, with a good friend of mine, Liam Maxwell, who's the UK government CTO. And one of the key things about it was the necessity of focusing on user needs. So if I take something like the emergency services mobile communication platform, which is all the radios for all the fire, the ambulance, the police, and so forth, Wonderful 300-page specification document. But if somebody asked them what is the user need, no one actually could say. It took them an afternoon to map the environment out. Now they had one document. And the user need becomes very easy. It's the stuff at the top. Point-to-point uh, -point communication, point-to-multiple point communication. The second thing that mapping helps with is coping with change. So if you have a line of business um, it's not static. It's evolving due to competition. And as it evolves, its characteristics change. So it starts off in this uncharted space where it's um, highly chaotic, it's uncertain, it's, it's constantly deviating, it's a potential source of future work. It doesn't matter whether it's money or penicillin or electricity or computing. It all starts on the left. And over an undetermined amount of time, it evolves and becomes more industrialized, ordered, known, measured, standards, dull. This is known as the Salomon and Innovation, sorry, Salomon and Story Innovation Paradox of 2002. All organizations contain these two extremes. And because of these two extremes, there's no such thing as one size fits all management methods. It doesn't matter whether we're talking about finance or whether we're talking about project management. So if I look at something like project management, agile in-house is very good in the uncharted space, but it sucks in the industrialized compared to things like Six Sigma. And in the middle, lean is probably the most appropriate. So on one side, you've got XP or Scrum. I happen to prefer XP. So on this side, we're about reducing the cost of change because that's the one thing we know is going to happen. It's going to change. 
But then we start to get an idea of what we want. And so we start to add artifacts, and this is where lean comes in. So now we're about reducing the cost of waste, so minimal viable products, etc. But eventually, over time, that act will evolve and become more industrialized. And at this point, we want to reduce deviation and the cost of deviation. So this is where Six Sigma becomes more appropriate. It's the same with purchasing methods. Time material-based, very strong, then it's more outcome-based, then it's more cost and fixed, and then eventually it's more unit and utility. So this impacts management. So something like HS2, high-speed rail, massive, enormous, heavy engineering project, uh, 50 billion plus in the UK. This is how they were trying to organize it, box and wire diagrams. Um, they converted it to maps. So this is a map of the, uh, the virtual world in which HS2 is being created in, because it turns out it's cheaper to dig up a virtual world than it is the physical world. Um, but building that system required multiple different components at different stages of evolution. And so using the map, they know the certain things they are in, going to be using outsourcing, Six Sigma type approach. Certain things, it's off-the-shelf products where it needs to be adapted, it's more lean. Certain things are being built in-house, agile techniques. So in UK government, in different projects, they've started to move away from this idea of one size fits all to the use of appropriate techniques and methods. Now, most organizations have no form of map, no way of visualizing the environment. So what they normally do is yo-yo. They normally go, we're all Six Sigma, and then, oh, no, we're all Agile, and, oh, no, we're all Lean, or something along those lines. Or they do the, the typical thing if they outsource too much. So outsourcing becomes popular in that organization. They cannot see the environment. They take a large system. They outsource it all, uh, wanting to have a very good specification because they want to know what's being delivered. And, of course, what will happen is the industrialized bits get efficiently treated because they don't change. Uh, the uncharted bits, because they constantly change. We are exploring. It's uncertain. It's unknown. Uh, will incur excessive change control costs. So you inevitably end up with an argument with the vendor. And the vendor says, well, it's all your fault uh, because the bits that you, uh, you didn't change your mind on were efficiently treated. And the cost is all because you didn't know what you actually wanted. You should have specified it better. And the answer is you can never specify it better because it's uncertain. Um, the next thing that maps tend to be useful for is removing bias, collaboration, and silos. So for example, this is borders. This is immigration. This is the National Police Database. And what happens is something like the Home Office, they have 25 different maps. You start to aggregate the maps. And you find that the same terms start to appear in multiple different maps at multiple different places. So what you discover is you've got duplication, i.e. the same teams building the same thing in different parts of the organization. And if you think government is bad, for bureaucracy, duplication, and bias, you cannot beat the private sector. Um, this is my leaderboard for the worst examples. And right at the very top is one global corporate which has 380 customized versions of the same ERP system doing exactly the same things for exactly the same types of users customized by 380 different teams. The worst example I've got in government is 118, which is workflow systems. We have 118 customized workflow systems doing the same things. But private sector, hands down, beats us every time. Uh, the next thing it's useful for is you start to remove bias. Because you start to discover that within your organization, you have people who treat some things like a commodity, and others who insist that it needs to be custom built. Uh, examples of this is a particular uh, company in the financial world. Um, it has 18-inch racks. Anybody know what the standard size for rack is? 19 inch, absolutely. They have custom built racks. And then they have a team of people whose job it is is to, when they get their custom built servers, uh, sorry, their standard commodity servers, to take the shelves off them and basically drill new holes so they will fit into their 18 inch customized racks. 
Yeah, I know you're going, what? <laughs> it makes no sense at all. This company shouldn't even own compute. It should probably be using a service like Amazon. But for some reason, it has decided, because in the past, somebody thought it would be a good idea to have a custom-built rack, that it will have teams of people who are today now taking commodity boxes and customizing them to fit into the racks. It's a complete waste of money. Um, but you find examples like this throughout the commercial sector. Uh, the next thing is contract and structure. Um, there's something called FIST, Fast and Expensive, Simple and Tiny, uh, developed by the US Air Force by Lieutenant Colonel Dan Ward. Um, the US Air Force discovered, and this is called the simplicity cycle, that on a scale of complexity and uh, uh, usefulness, oh goodness, what would happen is people would have an idea, then we'd add more features to the idea, so it would become you know, slightly more complex but more useful. And then people would add more features to the idea, so it became really, really complex and of no use to anyone. And that was roughly when they built it. And they thought, well, this is not a good idea. Um, what we want to do is we want to go down this way. And the way to do that is to take your large-scale systems and break them into small components, build them inexpensively, simple, and tiny. So when they built the intelligence agency's supercomputer, um, they applied the process and worked out the most effective way of doing this was to go out and buy 1,753 PlayStation 3s and wire them together. Um, it was a tenth of the price of buying a supercomputer, so they were quite happy. Uh, of course, for Sony, these are loss leaders. Um, they're games delivery vehicles, and I believe they bought a game, um, but uh, <laughs> that was about it. Uh, they also used it for what's called the Harvest Hawk. So the Harvest Hawk's a marine combat aircraft, and that went from paper to combat operations, firing its first shot in 19 months. So combat operations in 18 months, which, uh, you know, for that sort of hardware is pretty, pretty unheard of. So if I take something like the emergency services mobile communication platform, you would naturally break it down into small chunks, small little components. Of course, when you actually look at the contract structure, it's something else. That sort of big contract in the middle, how it was being organized, is where you get all the big change control cost overruns in government. Um, and of course, the problem is, with box and wire and specification documents, there's no way of seeing that your contract structure is flawed. But you also can use it for organization. So this happens to be a media company, a uh, TV company, a uh, user need, uh, leisure time, Two sources, aggregated sites, uh, and uh, uh, more branded. So, you know, Netflix versus BBC Channel 4. Uh, there's content, a pipeline of content, and components underneath it. And the way you treat it is you break it down into small chunks. So uh, Amazon uses what's known as the two-pizza rule. No team bigger than could be fed by two pieces. Of course, the problem is that all the chunks are evolving. And so if you do break it down, you find engineering over here in the uncharted space is not the same as engineering in the industrialized. And of course, everything will evolve. So the way you structure around it, if you want to create an adaptive structure, is you have what are called pioneers, settlers, and town planners. It's a three-party system. It's used in uh, particular parts of, uh, of government. Um, you, have, you find you have different cultures, three different cultures, three different types of uh, people. Not all people are the same. You can normally see it in an uh, IT department. If you take an IT department and send everybody on a six-week ITIL co course, uh, a large chunk come back miserable and unhappy. And if you send them all on a six-week hack day event, uh, another chunk come back miserable and unhappy. Not everybody is the same. Um, this particular method uh, was developed back in 1993. It's written about in a book called Accidental Empires. So quick recap, most organizations, we suck at situational awareness. Uh, it's relatively easy to create maps. Um, you take value chain evolution, combine the two together, create a map. Once you have a map, that helps people focus on user needs. You focus on using the right sort of methods and techniques. Helps you get rid of duplication and bias in an organization. You can also structure around it. 
But the more interesting thing about mapping is when you come to learning and gameplay, manipulation of markets. As with all maps, once you have a map, you can try and adjust it and see what works. You can actually use it as a learning vehicle. So what you have is position and movement. So back in 2005, that's the map I had, two things there, platform and compute. In 2005, we knew that was going to move to utility. We actually built the first platform as a service in 2005. We also knew that as a result, you would get higher order systems being developed. Things would be built on top. And this is because there are common patterns in the economy. One, efficiency enables innovation. As things evolve, uh, due to competition, so electricity moves from Siemens to sort of utility provision, what you see is not just efficiency of what it is, you see an explosion of higher order systems. So for example, electricity enables lighting, radio, television, etc. That simple componentization, Herbert Simon's theory of hierarchy. So if you think about nuts and bolts, homemade cottage industry, Maudsley introduced the screw cutting lathe, suddenly explosion of uh, uh, standard nuts and bolts, suddenly explosion of machinery. Those higher order systems are also sources of future work. Uh, you always get a shift of capital from one to another. That's known as creative destruction, Joseph Shambita. So competition enables efficiency, enables agility, enables new sources of work. One of the great things about open approaches and open source is it accelerates that process, drives it. So if you look through history, Electricity enabled computing. It's the same process and pattern being repeated over and over. Two, choice is an illusion. Those are powerful forces. If you are in competition with others and they have higher rates of agility, efficiency, and uh, ability to extract worth than you, then you are under pressure to adapt. As more change, that pressure mounts. This is known as the Red Queen effect. Uh, you need to continuously evolve just to stand still relative to a surrounding ecosystem. Now, this is networked effect, so um, it's exponential. So if you look at something like Amazon and you look at the rate of growth uh, for Amazon, uh, I put these figures together back in 2008. I used to run strategy for Ubuntu. Um, so back in 2008, um, we estimated where it was going to go. 1.5% of the market by about 2011, we reckon. 6% by about 2013, and we're not far off. Where do you think by the end of uh, 2016 in terms of server market? What would you say? 25? Yeah, somewhere between about 30 and 50. 40 and 50. Um, these changes are exponential. They're normal. Okay? And it normally takes about 10 to 15 years to wipe out a pre-existing industry once the point of industrialization has started. Uh, pattern three is we have inertia. We don't like the change. We don't like the change because of past success, whether we're a consumer or whether we're a provider in that space. And there's about 16 different forms of inertia. You don't have to worry about them, but no, they exist. Except for the one, changes to... to management and uh, governance. So I'll explain that one. Activities evolve. Not, uh, you start with Genesis, custom built, product, rental services, commodity, but also practices evolve. Exactly the same pattern. Novel, emerging, good and best. And the problem is these two co-evolve. So when compute was a product, we developed architectural practices based upon the idea of compute as a product. There was a long mean time to recover if your server went down. So we started building things like M plus one, making the servers more resilient. We used disaster recovery test. And because it was a product, we used scale up. That evolved and became best practice for a product world. Of course, what happened is the act evolved. It became more of a utility. As a result, novel practices emerge based upon the characteristics of volume operations good enough, lower MTTR. Things like scale out, distributed systems, design for failure, uh, chaos engines, chaos monkey as Netflix calls them. They evolved and became best practice for the utility world. 
So what we've got is applications built on best practice for a product world, and that's the legacy estate, and applications built with best practice for the utility world, and that is the new estate, DevOps. And of course, everybody wants to move their old stuff into this new world because they want the benefits of efficiency, agility, new sources of work. So what they normally do is they take the legacy, put it on Amazon. Amazon has an outage, and they run around screaming the end of cloud is nigh. Shouldn't that architecture evolve as well? To which their response is normally fairly negative. <laughs> they don't like it because there's a cost associated with re-architecting. But that cost is unavoidable. And that cost is a major source of inertia. Which is why vendors run in and say, what you need is an enterprise cloud. You know? Or roll in the enterprise cloud. I want an enterprise cloud. All the benefits of volume operations using commodity components built with non-commodity hardware customized to my needs. Yeah, can I change the laws of physics? Commodity does not equal non-commodity. Volume operations does not equal customization. Doesn't stop people trying to do completely the wrong thing, though. I mean, you have a choice, which is the public market. Uh, there's the hybrid of public and public, not so bad. The hybrid of, you know, you're into dodgy ground now. And then there's the, oh, we can do it just as well as Amazon and Google. The next pattern is inertia kills. So Kodak. Kodak was first with online photo digital still camera, out innovated the market. Um, it wasn't innovation or lack of it that killed Kodak. The problem is its fulfillment systems were based upon analog uh, imagery. So images went from analog to digital. They were first into the market with digital still cameras online, but their business, because it was based upon analog images, they had a conflict. Netflix Blockbuster, who was first with a website Video ordering online, video online on demand. Who was first? Blockbuster. By a long shot. What do you think took Blockbuster down? Hmm? Say? What took Blockbuster down? Too early? The shops. They had an internal conflict created. They were trying to get out of that. <laughs> so I'm going to quickly recap. I mean, once you start mapping, you start to discover common economic patterns. One, uh, innovation enables efficient, uh, sorry, efficiency enables innovation. Two, um, you know, choice is an illusion. We don't have it. Three, uh, we have inertia to change. Four, inertia is a killer. So I'm now going to talk about gameplay. Because if you've got a map, and I go back to that platform and compute, we knew that it was evolving. So we knew it was going to a utility. We knew it was going to enable higher order systems. We knew we would have inertia, and so would others. So the question then becomes, can we exploit this to our advantage? Is there ways of manipulating an environment? And the answer is yes. You can just let competition do it for you. You can accelerate it with an open approach. You can, if you're evil, slow it down with patterns. Or if you're really evil, slow it down with FUD, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. You can also use constraints. There are 61 different ways of manipulating a market that I'm aware of, and I've just told you four. Um, I'm not going to go through them all. Uh, the only thing I will do is point, can you see the top corner where it says L-G-N-L-E-C-E? -E? Bingo. Some of the methods are better, more, more, shall we say, friendly than others. Some of them are somewhat chaotically evil, uh, such as talent raiding, misdirecting organizations. Some of them are less benign. Um, that's, uh, I just simply ca characterize them according to how, how pleasant they are to use on competitors. But the point is, once you have a map and you can manipulate it, it tells you, well, you get multiple choices of where to attack. Do I attack this space, that space, or that space? And then strategy simply becomes that question of why one over another. So what's the impact of mapping? 
Well, I used it at Ubuntu. Uh, Ubuntu, I took ran Strashy for Ubuntu back in 2008 to 2010, Mark, for 18 months. Mark Shuttleworth's a good friend of mine. Um, we mapped out the environment. Uh, we were fighting compute on the server um, because we mapped it out. We knew we had to attack the utility space, which meant owning the guest OS. This is a very simplified map. We knew there would be co-evolved practices. We didn't know it was going to be called DevOps. Uh, we knew there would be development of uh, uh, new applications, etc. cetera. Um, I also mapped out competitors, uh, uh, one called Red Hat, for example, and used that to identify points of inertia within their organization. So for example, you know, salesmen making money from satellite licenses, subscriptions, so you know, Obviously, it was in our interest to make all the security updates free so they would have inertia to the change. Um, and so that was the result. Uh, the little blue line at the bottom was our percentage of operating system share in 2008. Uh, we spent less than a million dollars. And by 2010, Ubuntu was 70% of all cloud. And I think it's pretty much maintained that position today. Uh, these days, I do these games with government. Um, a lot more fun. <laughs> so I want to talk about the future. Um, because um, people talk about, you know, lots of stuff about the future, of course, is unpredictable. But there are certain common patterns which you can uh, use. So one of the things is things appear, and they go through a relatively peaceful state of competition. Big vendors build up. Uh, those vendors have inertia to change because of past success. So the app becomes suitable for more commodity provision. Uh, new entrants move in. We call it a state of war. And you get this period of rapid change, this punctuated equilibrium. Uh, that causes an explosion of higher order systems, this state of wonder. And of course, disruption of those past vendors. Now, to be honest, they should never get disrupted. Uh, there's like product to product substitution, unpredictable. Product to utility, you should never be disrupted by it, but they are because you can't, most can't see it. Now this particular pattern actually has, um, uh, the same pattern occurs in biological systems. Uh, we call it the adaptive renewal cycle. It occurs in um, our, our macroeconomic scale. We call them contractive waves. Um, so when you, these waves we normally call ages. So when you talk about things like the age of electricity, uh, these ages don't start with innovation. Uh, the innovation of electricity was uh, 400 AD. Um, they always start with commoditization of a pre-existing activity. This causes an explosion of higher order systems, new things like Hollywood, teletyping, all, all the rest of it. Time of dreams of wonder of magic unless you're a gas lamp lighter, in which case it's pretty miserable. Um, of course, it's difficult to say, don't worry, you, you could be a radio operator, because they will go, what's a radio? So, um, but anyway, uh, the same happened in the mechanical age, disruption of past industries, explosion of higher order systems caused by commoditization of mechanical components. Internet age was all about commoditization of the means of mass communication. Now, the beauty about this is that evolution, the pattern, can be determined by looking at publication types. So you can narrow down the range of when it's going to happen. It's one of uh, a set of weak signals that can be used. And the weak signals currently look like this. So all the cloud stuff is in that moment of change. Big data's just got into it. What that means is there's a whole bunch of product vendors running around thinking we are the future. And there's some utility providers set up. And of course, they're all dismissing them, saying, oh, you use that for test and dev, but in production, you buy our product. Well, in 10 to 15 years, most of those product vendors will be gone. Um, then we've got things like robotics, sensor as a service, lots of exciting future stuff coming up as well. Hmm? Currency, so digital currencies. OK, so quick summary, wrap it all up, because I've got five minutes left. Um, I mentioned uh, that uh, lawful, lethal, chaotic, uh, neutral, etc. cetera, um, in terms of the gameplay. Uh, the reality of business is little more than a game. Um, and that game requires maps um, to understand the environment. There are certain techniques and methods and spells you can use to manipulate it. And there are certain types of monsters. So I want to have a quick look at the corporate monster. So what does the corporate monster look like? It has no maps. So it sits around 
telling each other stories. Um, it tends to yo-yo from one method to another. Um, it tends to outsource vastly too much. Uh, it tends to have backward causality, copying what everybody else is doing. Uh, it tends to suffer from duplication bias and lacks the ability to, to anticipate. So there's four lessons. One, if you're doing a startup, do not worry about the large corporate. You have almost nothing to fear, particularly if you're looking at industrializing a space through the use of open source. Two, the future is awesome. Um, a lot of the open source movement has already moved into this space uh, in terms of IoT, immersive, 3D printing, robotics, sensor as a service. There's a lot of cool stuff which is about to be industrialized. Well, will be in the near future. Three, open source is changing. Um, it used to be a time that uh, um, open source was a, a sort of something the corporates um, didn't understand or didn't try to understand. We are now getting a whole new breed of people, the settlers as we like to call them, into open source. Every company out there wants to be open. Uh, as Robert Rommel said, um, Lefkowitz, you can't toss a fruit up in the air without hitting an open cloud foundation. Um, or open standards body on the way down. Okay, um, and the fourth and final thing is situation normal, everything must change. Uh, these patterns of economic uh, competition enabling uh, the commoditization of one set of components, a cycle of change with explosion of new components have been going on for 300 years and there is no evidence to suggest they're going to stop anytime soon. Thank you. Uh, all the work is Creative Commons, by the way, share alike. So, you're, so um, I'll put the slides up. You're welcome to use them all.